You don't understand how badly I want fall to be here. So let's talk about Brazil! This is a movie I think is very close to perfect. It's a masterpiece, as it is. And it's one that I do think I need to rewatch as soon as possible, because I had no clue what this was. I know Terry Gilliam, I, Killiam, whatever. I've seen the his new Don Quixote movie. I've seen the Zero Theorem. I've seen the Monty Python movie. So I know kind of his style, his dark sense of humor. It's a dystopian movie about a guy who is just living through the mundane grind of a nine to five political job. The movie is a gross exaggeration of what modern life was like back when this was released in the 80s. It's one of those movies that is exactly what you think it is and nothing at all like what you think it is. At least that was my experience with it. But the most interesting part is the fact that this was nearly shit canned by the studio. The head of the studio, Sid, whatever his name was, was coming after Terry Gilliam because he thought that this movie was too dark. He thought it needed a happier ending, a more mass appeal ending that would get it box office revenue. And he's not completely wrong. I, I do see where he's coming from because this movie is dark and it is depressing and it ends kind of on a bittersweet downbeat note that has earned it a cult status, but not a mainstream status. If you ask people if they know what Brazil is, I doubt that they would say anything but the country. It was a meeting in Frank Price's office who was head of production then. And I remember going up there and it was like being brought into the headmaster's office that I had done a very, very bad thing. But it's because of that ending that this movie is as good as it is. It's because of that ending that this movie is considered a masterpiece by today's standards. It's a cult movie, for sure, because it doesn't have a huge audience, but the audience it does have is ravenous, for good reason. The movie is fantastic from ground up. Everything about it, it does right. It's one of those very rare films that everything in it is done with purpose. And that's what I love to see, man. Every single detail of this movie is meticulously controlled by Terry Gilliam. The script, the production design, the costume design, the performances, you name it, and it is purposeful. You've been promoted. It's your mother, isn't it? Pulling strings again. So we follow Jonathan Price, who is a great actor in his own right, and there's a lot of really great standout performances in this from great standout actors like Robert De Niro, Ian Holm, just to name two. It has a great cast, and they do wonders for the believability of it because they're so committed, specifically Jonathan Price, who is fantastic as the leading guy. He's just this down and out boring guy. He goes to work, he doesn't want promotions, he doesn't want to rock the boat, he just kind of wants to live, work, go home, and do that all again the next day. He's a mundane guy who is caught in this system. He's caught in the mundane, tedious system that we all live through. I thought the first act was fantastic, though. The, the opening of this is so great. The first three scenes that we get are amazing setup for the story. We have a great sequence when a guy is trying to kill a bug and the bug guts fall on a computer or writer or something and it changes the name of somebody who's going to get taken away by the government, sort of like 1984, people get just disappearing, deleting as they call it in this. And so an innocent man gets taken away by SS officers and horrible Nazi-like people, and it ruins this family. And because of that error, it sends off this chain of events that leads to our main character, Jonathan Price, who we, of course, know as the man trapped in the machine. And he finds out that they got the wrong man, that the government stole and killed the wrong person. And so they get a refund check, and the check is supposed to be the sum of this man's life, more or less. The amount of money is supposed to make up for the fact that the government killed the wrong person. Do your ducks seem old-fashioned, out-of-date? Central Service's new duck designs 
are now available in hundreds of different colors. But it's in these scenes that we establish so much in so little time. We establish the horrible world that we're living in. The, the opening shot is of TVs trying to sell people colorful ducks. Like these giant air ducts that just litter every room in this world, making it this claustrophobic nightmare. And then the TVs explode because there's terror terrorist bombings. You have the setup of this great production design, the classism that's going on, and the oppressive government that is stealing people and deleting them if they are if they're revolting if they're standing up to them and then we have our introduction of our main character and we follow him and we understand his life and his relationship with his parents or his specifically his mom his dad is dead i think he's out of the picture at least and the relationship with the mom is great too we get a lot of setup with them there's this awesome subplot where the mom is old and she's trying to get plastic surgery to look young and all of her friends are doing the same but they're going through different doctors michael what did this happen to you now my complication had a little complication i'm just gonna i think i'm just gonna be like talking about scenes right now because there's so many great standout scenes one of my favorites is when they're at a diner this fancy diner and they're trying to order off this electronic menu that has everything labeled as one through eight or something, and the, the waiter's trying to get him to say a number. To say the number. Well, I must tell you all about it. Number three. And they bring out pictures of what they ordered, and then mulch cakes. Gross, off-colored cakes of whatever. Some gross thing that just has a picture of what it should taste like, I imagine. And then in the middle of the scene, a terrorist bomb explodes half the restaurant. A whole bunch of people are screaming and crying. The government shows up. Firefighters show up. And the rich people don't care at all. They even put a screen around the rich people to block the view of the chaos. And that was so great. It was hysterical. It's a perfect encapsulation of the society in the film visually. And that's one thing I loved about this movie specifically is how it tells things visually. There's a lot of exposition going on. There's many times when people are sitting down and talking to Jonathan Price about Mother, I just wish you would stop interfering. I don't want promotion. I'm happy where I am. No, you're not. Jack Lint is a lesson to you. He doesn't have your brains, but he's got the ambition. But more times than not, they counter the dull exposition with life in the frame. And dude, it's hard. I get it. It's very difficult to choreograph a scene when 15 people are th throwing letters and pieces of paper at a guy who's saying, no, 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 yes, no, agreed, stop. And he's also delivering exposition to Jonathan Price. That's hard. Between you and me, Larry, this is... No, no, department. Tell records to get stuff. He's about to be upgraded and... The... Ah! Here we are. Your very own number. I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the direction. Obviously, he does a great job of delivering exposition in a fun way, but the direction is what makes this movie. I loved how exaggerated everything is. It makes the, everything more fun. It's a dark movie. It's a dystopian, depressing movie about a world that we're currently living in through an exaggerated lens, and that's why it works so well. It has a dark sense of humor because of how Terry Gilliam shoots and writes scenes. The way he shoots scenes is typically in these exaggerated wide shots. Now, I typically don't like shooting with wide angles. I'm currently shooting with a wide, but I'm a little bit further from the camera here to give it a sense of scale, of space, but Terry Gilliam often has things incredibly close, which give it this weird depth and a kind of strange effect on faces. It makes things more exaggerated, it makes things longer. I also think the way he just choreographs scenes is great too. Outside of the exposition scenes, there's a lot of long camera movements. There's a lot of great compositions where characters, people, places, objects are moving around the scene all in one take. Like, for example, that scene when half a diner explodes. There's so much movement. There's so much choreography going on in just one lockdown shot. And it's really impressive stuff. You'd have to coordinate every actor to do the individual thing they need to do in the scene while 
other characters are trying to deliver dialogue and do their actions as well. It's difficult on the actors, it's difficult on the directors, it's difficult on the cinematographer because you have to compose all of this movement in depth. It's great stuff. I also love the juxtaposition we get with reality and our main character's dreams. Sam Lowry has these dreams of saving this woman, this beautiful dream girl, who he ends up meeting in real life, and that is what takes him out of the system. He realizes that this girl from his dreams is real. And if that's real, then maybe life's worth living. And that's essentially what kicks off the story in Act 2, is him finding the girl and going on with her and discovering more of the world, discovering more of the underground parts of the world. Man, my nose is itchy. Holy cow. It's okay, officer. Thank you. It's okay. I've got everything under control. Thank you. Oh, shit. Listen, please. Drive. Drive. Trust me. You are in terrible danger. You're an embarrassment, please. So one nitpick I have of this movie is I wanted more out of their relationship. I wanted more scenes where I got a sense that they were bonding. A lot of it is Jill just trying to get away from Sam because Sam is very awkward. He's like, I love you. You're the girl of my dreams. You've been in a whole bunch of my dreams. I have to marry you. You're amazing. And she's like, oh, that's weird. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I I'd be fine with this movie being two and a half hours or longer so that I could get a better sense of their relationship. But we do get some awesome fake outs near the end. It, it multiple times pretends like it's going to have a happy ending and then rips it away from you both times in brutal and very satisfying ways. But I've been dreaming about you. No, 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 not like that. I mean, I love you. I mean, in my dreams, I love you. I'm trying to skirt around this without giving up too much because I think the ending is one of the best aspects of the film. So just watch it if you haven't. Brazil, it's fantastic. Everything about it I think is incredibly well done. The only real nitpick I have is I wanted more out of the central relationship, but that's sort of a footnote to the rest of the movie, which is about powers that be, standing up to the system, trying to break out of the system, and understanding the world around you better, being a better person, yeah, generally. It's a good movie, man. It's, a, it's, a, it's not just a good movie, it's a fucking great movie. So, check it out. And honestly, I kind of want to stick to the Terry Gilliam train and move on to a another film that he did that I've been desperately wanting to see for years, and that's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. So we're going to stick with Gilliam and watch Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas just because I said so, motherfucker. Bye, dude.